period four, the whole period as AP is labeled from 1800 to 1848. We're going to break it on down as they used to say back in the 1970s. Break it down into two parts. Today we're going to do part one, 1800 to 1825. Kind of marks, you know, the election of 1800 to the end of the uh, Monroe presidency and somewhat the end of the era of good feelings, as they say. All right, so, and we're going to get started there. What you should know, all right, and these are the main three themes for the whole kind of, you know, early 19th century American history. Man, this is just, I love history. It's just so, so amazing. Even the world history this time, man, amazing, man. <laughs> it was like 12 years ago, Kanye West, right? Oh, 2000, man, I'm getting old. But anyway, that world history and U.S. history that's, that's going on here at this time in the Napoleonic era, but I know I'm you said get to the point, get to the, stay on the script, Mr. Price, please. Uh, the main three themes, growing nationalism, and as a contradiction to this that's going on in parallel is growing sectionalism. As you see with the, you know, the slave states versus the northern states and somewhat the Midwest kind of being fought over by political and kind of economic control by the northern states and the southern states. And the last thing is growing uh, economy. So growing economy, growing sectionalism, growing nationalism. Three major things. Keep that in your head. Keep that in your head, please, like I say, before you get the devil in details. First, first of the all-star elections. The Revolution of 1800, you know all that jazz. Jefferson versus Adams, peaceful transition from the, you know, the um, Federalist Party to the Republican Party. And, and I, you know what the Republican Party at, is at this time. And we don't need all the, you know, gee, I hate Lamb or the Jefferson president. We just get the major, major hits for the online exam. The ones that I expect you that you should know and say almost a given. It's a layup. It's a reverse jam behind the back there like that. So that you do know for sure. And that is, you know, the Marbury versus Madison case. And that's with the midnight judges. And... and I'm not going to really go with the Supreme Court cases like a Fletcher versus Peck or anything of that nature or McCulloch versus Maryland, Gibbons versus but you should know John Marshall and the Marshall Court. You should know all my deal breaker Supreme Court cases, you know, the Scott versus Sanford Plessy, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, Cormazzi versus the United States. So you, you, I, I'm just not going to, because I'm saying I assume that you know though since the first grade almost and some details in there so I'm not going to, but you should know John Marshall because he keeps the national government growing developing expanding he is a loose interpreter of the Constitution yes you can have that bank yes you yes Mr. Jefferson you are definitely wrong about like you know not appointing giving the commission to like Mr. Marbury but you know, at least I'm going to do something and say, hey, we have the right to interpret the Constitution given this power of judicial review. I, I assume you kind of know. And the other big hits, especially like during that year, too, of 1803, Louisiana Purchase, you know, that since first grade, double side United States, and the Embargo Act. And I don't know if that's a hit for Jefferson. That's kind of <laughs> a big a big loser for him, if you want to say, in 1807. And we go over that, really, uh, I want to make this clear, in the Part 3 Thesis Work video. Part 3 Thesis Work video, I go over the lead up to the War of 1812 and going in, it, you know, into the results, details, and, the, and going over the thesis work. Okay, cool. Now, again, entered his, you know, fellow Virginian, you know, the little giant is James Madison. Mr. Madison's World War, 1812. Um, 
The only thing I would want to add besides that part three thesis video that you should go back and look at for the War of 1812 is the Hartford Convention because that deals with the same thing about states' rights, you know, versus the national government. They're the ones that first kind of proposed and doing that convention. Maybe, you know, they didn't put it in writing, like I say, but it definitely proposed to come up, maybe seceding from the United States. Goes along with that, you know. Alien sedition, uh, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, going to the tariff abominations, going to this kind of like, you know, continued kind of uh, constitutional fight. Very good. So, the federal versus state powers in there. All right, good. We got that. Now, that's done. Now we actually get to what we call one party politics what people will label as the era of good feelings, or we like to say in AP history class, I know with Mr. Price, is the era of mixed feelings, okay? So, un our uneasy feelings. It's not on the surface or um, on reading the, the news headlines of that day or, you know, what they're printing is saying like, oh, you, or what historians have kind of labeled post James Monroe Press is the era of good feelings. Um, it's not underneath, there's not a reality. Deal breaker, deal breaker time. It is a deal breaker time. I expect you to know this or you see the hands coming at you like, you know, I can't believe you did not know the American system. I, it's a given. It has a great little acronym that we come up with, the BIT. You know, the second bank of the United States. Internal improvements in Mr. Hamilton's favorite, you know, tariffs and actually protective tariffs for the industry raising up. And you know, that's going to be the common theme for the 19th century is the tariff. And that's where federal government raises a lot of revenues this time is tariffs and land. There's no, you know, in, um, you know, national income tax. So the American system, that's a deal breaker. Other deal breakers in here during this time is, you know, a couple of things, is the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that, you know, you got to know this is the growing, you know, slave debate. You know, since again, for this first grade of Missouri, is like comes in as a slave state, means a free state, you know, uh, 36 degrees, 30 minute parallel, like again, that slavery is, you know, banned, you know, at, above that line. So, um, that, the Missouri Compromise. And then we get two big things coming up here you definitely the Monroe Doctrine which I look at the short answer question video about the Monroe Doctrine. look at the short answer question video about the Monroe Doctrine because I talk about you know all that look that again that's first grade thing I let's just say you don't know some of these things I've told you start there it's like wait a minute let me just you know, read about the Monroe Doctrine and make sure I got all the details about that. And finally, our next kind of big all-star election here is 1824, the corrupt bargain uh, with the favorite sons kind of going along with the Adams, the Jackson, uh, William Crawford, and Henry Clay. And we know what, you know, Jackson and his supporters accused of Quincy as of a corrupt bargain. We don't know if it's an actual deal was made, but he... Henry Clay does become the Secretary of State, and even though Jackson got most of the votes, most of the electoral votes, but not the majority, he does not become president, as John Quinn said. Also, our elections, we already had 1800, 1824, I'll say 1861, you know, to Lincoln, and I put it 1896, McKinley, and um, what we have here is 1912, you know, again, uh, with uh, Taft. Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and my communist friend, Eugene B. Debs. Okay, all right, so that's what you should do. We're making very good progress, uh, and I know notes are coming up here. Like this again, usually I was over on my left side here, so uh, make sure you copy those down, type, type those up, or whatever that you may do uh, on this. Now, what I'm going to go through is the market revolution. And um, what I always say about the market revolution is this, just something to keep in your mind as an acronym, the four or five C's, the four or five C's, uh, canals, cotton, communication, 
customers because that's what the market is all about. And maybe a fifth C is that they, what's driving is like coal and steam energy here. So that's uh, on there. So that is the four or five C's to remember the major part. So on unit four, progress check, the uh, free response question part B. And I'll put the prompt up here. Evaluate the extent to which new technologies caused the market revolution in the period from 1800 to 1848. Now, I'm going to put this thesis up here so uh, as an answer. And you can put this in kind of your response when you type it up for your assignment that's due next Wednesday. Or, better yet, you can play with my thesis sharpen it up or do you can have go at another angle i always like to do the counter while new technologies contributed to a market revolution in the united states in the period from 1800 to 1848 see that that's okay to use part of it like that you know the primary causes were transportation and infrastructure moving so i didn't you know so we're moving away in my argument in here from concentrated specifically on the technologies of Zyla, if I was going to do a full essay. You know, I have to do a full essay. The increasing number of Americans who work for wages, that's something that we kind of forget about, the kind of wage labor market now, and participated in the early capitalist economy, the growing capitalist economy, kind of like the small baby gilded age going on here, but it's mostly concentrated about uh, customers and and you know uh, people are finally getting wages working for a certain time setting the stage for our big grown-up gilded age in the late 19th century and the expansion of the country through actions and ideals uh, from the Louisiana Purchase Manifest Destiny and the, if you go to 1848 the Mexican-American War and Mexican Secession. Context uh, the rise in industrialization and the growing ca cash crop economy, not only in the United States, but around the world. And you know, cotton is king in, in uh, the South during this time. Uh, the growing nationalism that happens after the War of 1812. And almost a growing intertrade or the internation trade that's coming on here in the United States. Our growing, you know, independence amongst ourselves. We're trading with other nations. We're always going to keep increasing that interdependence, but we're also becoming a little bit more, um, you know, producing our own goods here. And that it was a, you know, again, a side offshoot, unintended consequence of the Embargo Act and definitely result out of the War of 1812 and definitely just the growing technologies and that's, you know, affecting the economy and ideas and developments in here and the growing infrastructure and the overall economy. Very good. Um, so, and we're, we're examining our boundaries, we want to expand our democratic ideals, Jacksonian democracy, and manifest destiny. Some, and you might, and then in your answer, put out some, and I, I'll have this up here, you want to talk about the division of labor, the, you know, um, putting out system, factory system, you know, you could put some, I guess for your answer for this one, you would not put so much the, the technologies like the steel plow, like the, <coughs> Like <laughs> uh, all the uh, don't fear it, the reapers like that, you know, the mechanical reapers there, um, Cyrus McCormick, or even maybe even the telegraph. And again, I market revolution, I know AP and other stores like to say, you know, oh, what about the trains? It, look, trains are developing. I'd like to keep trains always in the Guilt the real grown up Gilded Age, the 1850s, like that in here. Yes, they're getting started, but it's all about the canals. And you, you, I wouldn't say it's the American system, growing infrastructure, that would be more of your kind of, um, you know, evidence during this time. Analysis that you see that what you're seeing here is that with the Erie Canal starting in 1817, completed in 1825, you have a connection now from the east to the Midwest and really down to the south and away on the Mississippi. So the Ohio Canal, just the growth of canals and the transportation, it is going to be superseded by the trains that's going on, but that's going to become later. The national roads. Um, 
the, the, now again, even though the national government is, that's one of the things that's not going to be like funding the American system. State governments are going to be taking over that funding because it's built to build up this growing infrastructure. You see that analysis. You, that should be part of your answer in there. So all these kind of innovations in the transportation infrastructure market, connecting to your that sea of customers, the other sea there, like again, that's why a lot of times it's called a market revolution. How New York City just grows because they're connected to Western New York, they're connected to the Midwest, they can sell their goods at this time. So, um, that's what you'll be talking about. And just to, just maybe you want to talk about uh, Samuel Slater, the trader, the factory system. Girls are going to be hired, these little, you know, uh, young single girls in the, you know, a low factory system to work in these factories. Low wages, but are wages at this time. So you begin to see the formations of uh, of a kind of a, what a factory system almost really looks like in a factory workforce is growing wage labor or free labor as the North would like to claim up around like in, in that area that's happening around the market revolution. So you will say, and you can talk about if you wanted to the analysis about development of cotton, the cotton is king, you know, and their uh, the use of interchangeable parts uh, and just how it just makes the factory system. So, and again, the, just the ideas about, and, and I cannot say enough about steam power at this time. Not only driving the factory system, driving a lot of the uh, production and the output, but even, you know, in the communication system, newspapers having these like steam press, like powered press, putting out these like broadside sheets and, and you know, somewhat we call early like newsprint and uh, papers that uh, in here in communication. And that is really, again, just, you know, um, driving people. You can get out your advertisements, early advertisements of what's on the market to these general stores out to the Midwest uh, at this time. And the South is not only supplying cotton to the world, it's supplying cotton to the northern and midwestern factories that's developing here so they can produce goods as well. So uh, that's what you would do and I'll have this on here. Um, you, I also want to, you know, just thinking about uh, go back to the land because I put that in my thesis so you know just I always want to like you know prove about that um, you could go to the Louisiana Purchase the kind of the uh, Rush Bago Treaty the Adams Onis Treaty West Ashburn but the two big ones are the Louisiana Purchase and the Mexican Session you think about the 15 million dollars for each one here and it really kind of completes the United States and the manifest destiny ideas being developed in the 1840s here about that we should you know go from the Atlantic to Pacific that's what the United States should reach and that is definitely increasing this kind of you know new customer base new kind of enrichment base here with land man I, that's good I mean oh man it's like I getting more efficient here <laughs> <laughs> as long as I stay on top, I'm going to start talking about other things, I was, you know, uh, like I usually do in class. So this will be um, annotated, and I hopefully you go through this. I hope to see a few of you tomorrow or hear from you tomorrow. I definitely will give you quick as I see the updates. I'm going to disseminate that and kind of diffuse that and spread that amongst the STEM masses and the 11th graders about what the details and what to expect for so you have a more of a target and we'll have more of a target about what we should be practicing on here for the A push online test. We know one thing is 45 minutes, we know it's going to be free response and I my caveat warning again I'm hoping that you're not thinking because it's you're at home you got some books out or whatever and stuff like that you're gonna get the prompt you're gonna be able to look through those things you only have 45 minutes they're not dumb they're gonna make sure that you something that you to have a good answer a good you're gonna to have to really come more of on your own or you're not gonna be able to answer the question cite evidence and explain that evidence during that time about ace and uh, the problem. Okay, all right, ask it enough because you know I can, you know, keep on going on and on and on and on and everything. So, uh, love you all. See some of you tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, so goodbye. Have a good Thursday.